Honorary Rectors, Your Excellencies, colleagues, students and friends, uh, my thanks to you all for being here uh, and to the Rector and Professor Pasteur and no doubt to others for this very, very kind in invitation. Um, my congratulations to all of you who are here celebrating the 30 years that Leuven has really pioneered at the study of Europe. Um, I'm somewhat lost for words, but I, I shall recover quickly. Uh, it's a moving and humbling experience to be invited to give this lecture to you. What better place to think about the relationship between Europe's past and its future than here in Leuven, whose wanton destruction just over a century ago shocked the world and offered a foretaste of the worst that the 20th century was to bring? And what better place than this great university with its storied past that encapsulates within it so much of European history and whose library was rebuilt after the First World War by an alumnus of my own university, Columbia. This university's patron saint is Mary, enthroned on the seat of wisdom. And I'm not unfamiliar with the Virgin because on the Greek island that's my own second home, Mary also presides in the shape of an icon which provides the visible manifestation of her great grace. I shall hope that you and she show me your grace and do not repent of your lack of wisdom as you listen to these reflections today. The question I've been is, will Europe's past become its future? And there is, of course, a very simple way to answer this. At the start of the 20th century, the continent had fewer than half the number of states that it has today, and of these there was none truly independent that enjoyed universal suffrage, none. A mere two of them were republics, and the rest were ruled on some version of the hereditary principle. 40% of the continent's labor force worked the land, compared with approximately 5% today. The state was a shadow of its present self. In Germany, for instance, where the state loomed relatively large, public spending amounted to no more than 12% of GNP, compared with about 40% or more today. And at least half of this was spent on the military, and not as now, on health and pensions, an entirely unpredicted development. Wheat was a more precious commodity than oil, and there were roughly 14 million horses and 15,000 cars in Europe as a whole. So this could be a very short lecture, unless we seriously believe the continent can revert to its agrarian, pre-democratic, monarchical model that prevailed before 1914, the past is gone forever. But of course, that's not what people usually mean when they conjure up the image of the returning past. The past in these cases represents something to be feared, something to ward off, the threat of an international system of states spiraling downwards into war perhaps, or the threat of a resurgent fascism and authoritarianism. Indeed, one might say that fear of the past is the main way in which many people are accustomed to utilizing the past in thinking politically about the present and the choices ahead of them. What I want to suggest today is that if the past is useful to think with, it's not because we should fear it. I shall say more on this in concluding the lecture, but essentially the value, it seems to me, of thinking with history, there's a wonderful book by Karl Shorsky with that title, is that it helps us to try to situate ourselves historically in time, to see ourselves, as it were, from the vantage point of an as yet uncertain future. It's not that the past can return, but rather that the lessons we may draw from past events remain pertinent. This is especially so in that what I take to be the single most urgent challenge facing Europeans as political subjects is the same conundrum that has faced them for the entire preceding century, how to reconcile capitalism and democracy. Between these two, there is no necessary relationship. You may have capitalism without much freedom, as in contemporary China. You may have democracy without capitalism, as for instance in parts of ancient Greece. Some theorists have even argued the two inherently opposed. Nikos Poulantzas, for instance, the Greek Marxist, saw the capitalist state as designed to ensure the permanent subordination of the majority dominated classes. And yet, the political structure of contemporary Europe is based upon the supposition that they can and should be made compatible. It has not turned out to be so easy. And I do not think we can say we've solved this particular conundrum right now. In an age when at least four far-right parties are in government in member states of the European Union, we need all the help we can get in thinking how to reconcile them better than we're doing right now. And history is, I believe, a good way to get started. <laughs>
two protean terms, capitalism and democracy, of course, both of them perhaps repaying a moment's closer scrutiny. If you talk about capitalism, you're already taking up a certain vantage point. There's not many capitalists who talk about capitalism. It is to attempt to get a view of the prevailing structures and norms of economic life from outside, to analyze them in ways that do not foreclose the possibility of more or less radical change involving constraints to market freedoms or limits on private property. Of course, such constraints and limits have always existed, imposed not least by moral considerations. For much of the 19th and 20th centuries, thinking in this critical way was relatively easily done, thanks to the vitality of powerful traditions of thought that lent themselves to such a vantage point. One of these was what you might loosely call political Catholicism. The other was, of course, socialism. And I think it was the, as it were, rapprochement between these two currents after 1945 that paved the way for the kind of managed capitalism that emerged in the post-war era. Moreover, one of the reasons that they came together was that in the background of all this, there was a rival system, Soviet communism, whose very existence posited a powerful challenge to devotees of the free market because it proved, at the least, that an alternative was possible. Although whether it was desirable was up for debate. I shall say more about this below, but for now I simply wish to make the obvious point that whilst both of these intellectual traditions survive in an attenuated form, the sense of capitalism as a kind of ideological choice has vanished. Even before the collapse of the Soviet Union, communism had ceased to function as a plausible alternative for most people. The survival of the Communist Party in China, ushering in a form of party-led capitalism, doesn't, I think, materially change this conclusion. So to think about capitalism today in the absence of existent alternatives must basically require thinking historically about how we, meaning we here in Europe, arrived at this particular set of rules and practices and what it took to get us here and how and if we might wish to modify them. And that's surely important because the form of capitalism that prevails in Europe today is not only very different from that existing a century ago, it's even substantially different from that which prevailed a mere 30 or 40 years ago. Democracy is a no less complicated term, though for quite different reasons, in ways sort of opposite reasons. Lots of people might today balk at talking about capitalism, but it's quite unusual to find somebody uncomfortable using the word democracy. The problem is not that it may seem to be party pre, but that it can mean something to so many different kinds of people. Who, after all, in the 20th century was not a democrat? Bolshevism abjured bourgeois democracy, but did not shy away from describing its goal as a higher and better form of democratic participation. Fascism opposed liberalism and the democracy of parliamentary rule, but there were plenty of right-wing political theorists who argued plebiscitary dictatorship was what really brought in the Rousseauian will of the people, and that it was parliamentary democracies that were the sham, hiding the dictatorial rule of disguised elites, what some Nazis called democrature. A new book argues with some force that fascism itself represented a kind of democratization of Italian politics in the 1920s in that it brought far more people into the political process. We've had social democracy and liberal democracy, neither of them at all, I think, self-evident in terms of their meaning. And of course, after 1947, we saw how Soviet rule in Eastern Europe was justified in the terms of what Soviet theorists called, quote, an entirely new experiment in the history of mankind, meaning people's democracy. Chantal Mouffe, whom I believe you awarded an honorary doctorate to earlier this year, reminds us not to regard democratic credentials as something to be just bestowed or withdrawn, and that movements that are today written off as, quote, populist, may be no less expressions of forms of contemporary democracy. So that when I say the challenge politically facing Europe today is to reconcile capitalism and democracy, it's worth clarifying that what I mean is a form of democracy that preserves the personal liberties the representative multi-party electoral systems and the checks on executive power, but also the leg legitimacy that stems from substantive social welfare concerns, in short, the kind of polity that we've become accustomed to in Western Europe since the end of the Second World War. Now, if we approach the long 20th century history of Europe from this perspective, some features of the world before the First World War must immediately strike us. This was a capitalist world although there were still many areas of it that were only slowly being brought within the embrace of the market, sometimes indeed through imperialism. 
And it was a proto-democratizing world in which the slow move, very slow move to democracy inside Europe coincided with no new forms of colonial oppression outside it. Empires dominated, colonial empires run from Western Europe, controlled much of the world's resources outside the Americas, whilst the old land empires in Eastern Europe, stretching into Russia and the Middle East, ruled everywhere except in the Balkans. And it was there that the first tiny nation states had tentatively made their appearance. Demographically, Europeans were a larger proportion of the world's population than ever before or since, about 25% around 1900. Today it's less than 10% falling. Reflecting this, Europe was a net exporter of peoples, and there was almost no migration into the continent. None at all, really, if you count the western lands of the Russian Empire as part of Europe. And although it was industrializing fast in the continent as a whole, life remained rural and agrarian and rooted in the rhythms and the needs of land. Indeed, states thought in terms of protecting or acquiring land, and their alliance systems were largely designed to compensate for or adjust claims to land and to borders. Europe was, as it always had been, a continent in which war was a fact of life, though war was increasingly being systematized and codified. But today, Europe participates in an international system that, according to the terms of the UN Charter, outlaws the use of force except in defense and is hence deeply uncomfortable with the very notion of war. One reason, perhaps, why there have been no declarations of war, I believe, anywhere for nearly half a century now. In Europe, before the First World War, war was simply a recognized element of relations between states. What was new was that the armies engaged in fighting them involved the conscription of unprecedentedly large numbers of men, with immeasurable consequences for governance in peacetime in the 20th century. The outcome of the First World War posed the problem of democracy squarely in front of Europe, and not only because it left the American President Woodrow Wilson, who was committed to making the world safe for democracy, in the driving seat. Four years of war, fought by millions of men, could not but radically alter the terms of the social contract. Moreover, the effect on the map was instantaneous. The three land-based empires disappeared. National states became the norm. Habits of deference and privilege were suddenly eroded. Russian princes became Parisian taxi drivers. Between 1919 and 1922, national states run along Republican lines with constitutional democratic forms of government and strong legislatures emerged everywhere from the Baltic to the Eastern Mediterranean. Nationalism complicated the governance of Europe and exacerbated the territorial tensions left over by Versailles. Moreover, the victors at the Paris Peace Conference introduced a further innovation, international governance, in the form chiefly of the League of Nations, not as an antidote to nationalism, but as an expression of it. After all, 19th century theorists of nationalism like Mazzini had always argued that nationalists were the true internationalists and the League was an experiment testing the truth of this proposition, just as the European economic community would be later on. Mass suffrage, meaningful elections, alternating governments, this new kind of post-1918 democracy, for the most part the creation of professional men, chiefly lawyers and professors, was formally impeccable. The problem was how it worked in practice. Not enough thought had been given to the formation of enduring governments, through the need for a reasonably powerful executive. And the system was tested to the limit by the economic chaos of the interwar years and by the fact that it was shackled to two creations of that post-war economic order. On the one hand, it was associated with the territorial settlement imposed by Versailles, which was not universally popular, and on the other, by the desire to return to the gold standard that re represented the economic orthodoxy of the day. When the test came, as it did in the 1920s and 1930s, it was a world of actual political alternatives to parliamentary democracy. One of these was, of course, Bolshevism, whose triumph in Russia permanently left its mark on the bourgeois Democrats of 1919 because it showed that mass political pressure need not necessarily produce a liberal outcome. Yet while we shouldn't downplay the extent to which Soviet communism, through its very existence, raised the stakes for European democracies, especially after 1929. In retrospect, I think what was equally striking is the pretty much universal failure of revolutionary socialism to take hold anywhere in interwar Europe west of the Soviet borders. Communism was, in that sense, the great interwar failure of Europe. 
something which would tax the ingenuity of Stalin's Kremlin after 1945 when he had to build up pro-communist forces in a region, Eastern Europe, where they'd largely by 1940 ceased to exist entirely. A much greater challenge then to the European parliamentary model than Bolshevism was right-wing authoritarianism. By the mid-1920s, if no earlier, there was a fully-fledged debate in Europe about the so-called crisis of democracy, and the exits from this were almost entirely right-wing ones, starting with Admiral Horthy in Hungary and Mussolini in Italy. Historians and political scientists, as some of you will know, have spent much spilt much ink trying to define fascism, to figure out which regimes in those years were fascist as opposed to merely authoritarian of a military or a clerical caste. In a way, it's all beside the point. When Europeans waved goodbye to parliamentary democracy between the wars, the main thing is they were heading right, not left. Indeed, Michal Kaletsky, the great Polish economist, basically defined fascism as the way in which politically capitalism in the conditions of the interwar era could be made safe for the capitalist class by undermining the workers' bargaining power. He had a very simple two-sector model, and that's what gave you fascism in certain circumstances. By 1940, the only democracies left in Europe were the UK, Switzerland, Sweden, and arguably Denmark. This is worth pondering as we gaze on the emergence of the right across Europe today. Whatever we may think about it, and for me it's a symptom of crisis and a warning of where things may lead, we have to admit as historians that the right has deep roots in European soil. That doesn't mean it's destined for success, things didn't go so well last time round, but it does mean that the tendency of the post-war decades to assume away the existence of any kind of post-fascism was an error. The right, anti-liberal, anti-intellectual, anti-leftist, in favor of strong executive power, above all besotted with the idea of ethnic purity for a society defined on racial lines, was between the wars Europe's most powerful political creation. Given all this, 1945 represented an almost miraculous rebirth of democracy, but it was in really something more than a rebirth given the scale of its interwar repudiation. It was a real rethink, a rethink that took the shape of an ideological contest between the two political systems of the East and the West. In Eastern Europe, Soviet rule evolved via, via popular front-style communist-led governments that by 1949 were being touted by Soviet political scientists as people's democracies. Resting initially on high levels of coercion, along with major industrialization projects, their real challenge was to reconcile Soviet security interests and the need for stability with expressions of East European nationalism. Western Europe had from every vantage point an easier task because satisfying American security concerns did not mean suppressing native political sympathies, nor did it mean introducing a highly ambitious new form of economic planning in one of the continent's poorest regions. Instead, it turned out basically to mean cooperating across borders more than you'd done in the past, accepting some advice and scarce dollar counterpart funds, and allowing a formerly resilient capitalist system to grow again rather than building a new industrial economy from scratch, as in the East. In that sense, West European, Western Europe's political, post-war political elite had it a lot easier than their East European counterparts. Democracy returned through parliamentary politics, multi-party systems, which manifested a new degree of ideological convergence from the right and the left, which of freedom and human rights that was extolled through organizations, new organizations, like the Council for Europe. At the same time, post-war West European democracy gained legitimacy through the actions of a vastly expanded range of social and economic state provisions. The origins of this went back earlier. After the First World War, and especially after the crash of 29, the wartime model of expanded state competence acquired peacetime uses, and you can see this in a whole range of domains. Intelligence services between the wars expand and become professionalized. In statistics, industrial relations, welfare policy, strategic economic planning, there's a new conception of the state as a powerful instrument of social betterment right across the political spectrum. The Nazi Volksgemeinschaft, the Polish Social Survey, the Mass Observation Project in England, and even new journals like View and Picture Post were variants on this single theme that a national community was coming into being and the state had a critical role in fostering it. The impact of the Russian experience on this new understanding of what the state could and should do needs no special emphasis. 
Without the example of real existing socialism in the 1930s, whether as reality or more likely for many people a kind of projection, the new forms of state-society relations between the wars were inconceivable. Even within fascism, submerged and often marginalized traditions of syndicalism in Italy and national Bolshevism in Germany, Goebbels had come out of the national Bolshevist wing of the Nazi party, remained potent and became more influential as rearmament steered these economies away from unemployment and increased the political influence of labor, even under dictatorship. We know from the word of work of Philip Nord and others that as democratic regimes were reintroduced to Western Europe after 1945, the expansion of this kind of welfare state system became one of the principal legitimating instruments for the new political regimes. They indicated that the night watchman state that remained the ideal for many liberals in the 1920s was understood after the expression of fascism to be no longer viable in the modern world. Taxes rose as a proportion of GNP, as did state spending, and yet this new high-taxing model of capitalism was willingly accepted as the price for democracy's revival. High taxing, high spending. But was this new form of capitalism that was emerging in Western Europe a form of national economy? Or to put it another way, what was the importance of the European idea and of interstate cooperation in the growth that took place during the Trente Glorieuses? I want to here to draw attention for a moment to what I think is an underappreciated dimension of the history of the common market. We know that the path to European integration was not a smooth one. We know it was littered with false starts. The Marshall Plan's Council for European Economic Cooperation, for instance, or the Hague Congress, or the European Defence Community fizzled for a moment and then sank without trace. The integrative process began in earnest first with the European coal and steel community and then with the common market. The Treaty of Rome promised in those fateful words a movement towards, quote, ever closer union. What we perhaps tend to forget is just how far off such a thing seemed then or really was in the circumstances of the mid-1950s. Essentially, the dollar shortage, wartime destruction, and monetary chaos at the end of the Second World War meant that West European economies remained, if not in the state of autarky of the 30s, then pretty close. Italy's exports, for instance, in 1955, at the time of the Messina Conference, were a mere 8% of GNP, whereas Germany's 14%. By comparison, the figures for the early 21st century, 21% for Italy, 33% for Germany, and these underplay the degree to which these economies have opened up because they don't take any account of financial services. What am I trying to say? For much of the so-called Trente Glorieuse, the booming economies of the common market retained a high degree of autonomy in national economic decision-making. Most countries had some kind of ministry either of national economic planning, infrastructure or public works or all of these things. The common market thus started off as an aid to manage nat national capitalism, not a substitute for it. And the project of European integration benefited from the apparent achievement of post-war democratic politicians and technocratic elites in banishing the memory of mass unemployment in particular. Indeed, as we know, the demand for labor was significant enough to suck in economic migrants on an unprecedented scale from the former colonies and the Mediterranean littoral. And this vast social transformation in Western Europe took place really without any discernible long-term rise in the extreme right then. The ending of the Trente Glorieuse in the twin oil shocks of the 1970s and the ending of Western Europe's experience of full employment brought major changes to Europe and the integration process. In the first place, as we know from the works of Ravi Abdelal and others, it was European politicians and technocrats who crafted the new international norms that underpinned our contemporary highly open form of global financial capitalism. Working as much through the OECD and the IMF as through the US Treasury and the World Trade Organization, men like Michel Camdessou opened up European economies. And then the integration process itself took a leap forward with the creation of the European Union on the one hand and the Euro on the other. The British, God bless them, had always hoped that widening Europe would stop its deepening. They were wrong. Both of these things happened at the same time. By the first years of the new millennium, the European Union was a far more powerful entity than the common market had ever been and its chief institutions wielded unprecedented power. The balance between national economic autonomy and union-level policy shifted very decisively, and for a time, both the center-left and the center-right believed it could benefit them. 
but it wasn't to be. Once the love-in with global capitalism soured in the debt crisis of 2009 to 10, this left the European project politically exposed. Identified now with the defense of the euro and the politics of austerity that were designed to safeguard this, the European Union could not avoid some of the responsibility for the economic and social problems that have followed. The erosion of a social Europe and the highly unequal benefits that have accrued to member countries of the euro played out in the political turmoil that followed. In short, if the European project in the 1950s to the 1970s gained legitimacy from Western Europe's seemingly successful experiment in managed capitalism, it has used up, I think, much of that political capital in the last decade. And with the left on the defensive, it's the right that has turned the language of democracy against the Union and thereby profited at the ballot box. Outside Britain, which is a special case, I think, this call to defend national sovereignty that comes from the right has not on the whole led to calls to withdraw from the Union. Most right-wing parties remain in favor of European cooperation in some form, and why they do so is an interesting question. One answer might be that such parties are themselves unconvinced that their electorates are ready for the alternative. Another, not unconnected, is that they're conscious of the fundamental transformation of Europe's ge geopolitical position over the past decades. If we're interested in how to think about the relationship between capitalism and democracy, I think then that the last factor we must seek to understand is how radically Europe's century of turmoil has altered its position in the world. It's not merely that its demographic mass has shrunk. If we were to combine the populations of Europe and North America, think of a kind of Euro-America as it were, they represented 57% of the world's population in 1900, an extraordinarily high amount, and less than half than that, less than 25% today. It's also a continent which it would be no exaggeration to say dominated world affairs in 1900 through its economic success and its military strength, but is incapable of doing so now. In 1914, Britain and Germany were by far the world's largest military and naval powers, and the United States I'm not even going to talk about China in this regard, was quite secondary with a medium-sized navy and a rather small army. Today, no European power is in the top three. The UK spends $46 billion in defence a year, under 10% of the US total, and its army is about as small as at any time since the Napoleonic Wars. In 1914, the British, the French, the German empires were all in the top five so far as global rankings of GDP were concerned. Today, individually, they count for relatively little. On the other hand, as the European Union, they represent the second largest GDP in the world. And so geopolitics underpins the continued legitimation of the EU in European eyes. That global muscle is one of its evident reasons for existence. Could it be said that the desire to avoid war is another? Perhaps. After all, Europe is, for the very first time in its history, united, or very nearly, in a common political organisation. It's, of course, of the nature of this organization that it acts as an intergovernmental institution, or better, set of institutions, that are compatible with the continued existence of nation states, and so its existence, like that of any intergovernmental organization, constantly poses the question of democratic accountability. This question has, as we've seen, grown more urgent since the economic crisis increased the social pain of keeping the union together and increased popular pressure on the elites who've crafted its policies. But would its disintegration mean an increased likelihood of war? Would it plunge us into the back, into the bad old days of the past? The issue returns us, and this is where I will end, with history and its utility. The 1957 Treaty of Rome was signed by men whose average age was in the late 50s. That is to say, they had personal memories of two world wars. Adenauer, the oldest, had been mayor of Cologne in the First World War. Spark had been a POW in the hands of the Germans. Among the younger men there, Hallstein had been in the Wehrmacht and later he was a prisoner of war in Mississippi. Lunds had flirted with the Dutch Nazis and Faure and Pinot had both been in the French resistance. What side they had been on was of secondary consequence. War was an existential reality to them and they had lived what it meant. They understood the need for peace. The contrast with today's generation of European leaders is striking. I totted it up and the average age of the current prime ministers is 52. They can remember no wars at all, in other words, unless we include Yugoslavia in the 1990s. They are, in effect, the beneficiaries of the work of their grandparents. But in the meantime, the world has changed. 
Today, global warming, economic competition from Asia and the US, and internal policing and security are more immediate concerns than war, where Europe is concerned. There are no peace settlements to be revised, except perhaps on Russia's western and southern flanks. And so for most Europeans, the argument that the Union is needed to prevent countries returning to their warlike past seems implausible. One of the reasons, one of the many reasons, I think, that the entire Brexit debate has been so depressing is that it has often taken the form of one implausible historical worry being pitted against another. On the one hand, the Remainers warning of continental disintegration. On the other hand, the Leavers start replaying the Battle of Britain in an endless psychodrama of imperial nostalgia. So I do not think that the fundamental criticism of today's political elite is that they're indifferent to the dangers of war because it really doesn't seem a very likely proposition right now. More damning in my mind is their complacency about the state of European democracy. The sort of rapid historical sketch I offered here suggests, firstly, that capitalism has not necessarily led to, nor even supported democratic values, and secondly, that democracy, far from being sturdily implanted in European soil, has needed to be constantly nurtured. Between the two world wars, capitalism survived, but democracy did not. One of the factors that contributed to its demise was the politics of austerity, 1920s style, and the sacrifices imposed on working populations in the name of the gold standard. When democracy was restored after 45, it was only with the still vivid memory of what the alternative fascism had led to, and with the realization that a democracy to remain legitimate had to concern itself with more than the stability of the currency. What worries me is that today's European elites may be losing sight of these experiences. They've lost sight of the fact that the first phase of European integration took place in a world in which a considerable degree of national economic autarky remained, and in which the avoidance of the mass unemployment of the interwar years was a national priority. They've lost sight, too, of the tremendous changes that have taken place from the 1980s onwards. One of these, perhaps the most important, was the new freedom of capital mobility across frontiers that began then. There's simply no historical precedent, none, for the openness today of national economies to global trade and capital flows. Openness is a neutral or even a positive term. Vulnerability might be another way to think about it, a kind of constraint upon what it means today to govern at the national level. And second, this constraint upon national sovereignty was, of course, intensified by trends internal to the process of European integration itself. The 2007 Treaty on European Union emphasized the importance of democratic values and institutions in the life of the Union. Yet there was no gain saying the fact that the existence of a single market, a common currency, a single central bank, armed with the power to oversee compliance to common fiscal norms, represented a very different environment for national economic decision-making to that of the 1950s. In 2004, 10 new countries joined, increasing the EU's population by 20%, but its GDP by only five. This was always going to pose a challenge to the Union's social capacity. The crisis since 2009 has made the challenge much greater. Tackling unemployment remains one of the key demands across Europe for a more effective EU response. And although rates across the continent have been coming down, the gulf between core and periphery remain high. To conclude, Europe's future will not be the same as its past. We cannot return to the world of the Ancien Regime. Nor will democratic institutions find themselves facing the kinds of challenges that beset them after the First World War. But so long as European political allegiances and sentiments remain rooted in a sense of national belonging, the continent's turn to a unified political system through the European Union will always be a somewhat delicate business. And I simply don't think the Union and its leadership has yet woken up to the political implications of its new powers. Globalization in its contemporary guise is leading us away from social equality, not towards it. If the Union is to live up to its democratic rhetoric, I think this will require a more decisive turn than we've seen so far away from the defense of monetary stability and budgetary orthodoxy towards a politics of social solidarity. The struggle to reconcile capitalism and democracy continues. Thank you.